Good evening. Thank you for joining us uh, for today's uh, meeting on the Providence District. Um, Active transportation in the Providence District. And we're hoping to have a community community conversation with you today um, on uh, the um, you know, your experience being a pedestrian and a cyclist in the Providence district. And this meeting is part of the active Fairfax transportation plan. Uh, first, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Nicole Winans. I am uh, with the Fairfax town department transportation. I'm an active transportation planner as well as a um, project manager for this project. I'm joined here today uh, by Tom Bishotny, who is the director of the Fairfax County Department of Transportation, as well as uh, David Loss, who is uh, also in the active transportation program at Fairfax County Department of Transportation. He is uh, our bike share program manager and also responsible for outreach, and he will be helping me with the technology side of things. And uh, a special welcome to Supervisor Dalia Pelchik. Um, Supervisor, would you like to say a few words before we get started? Sure, thank you so much, Nicole, and your team for being here tonight. Um, as many of you know, this year more than ever, we've seen how important it is um, to have our active transportation. Uh, and I'm especially interested in what we see here in this picture is safe crossings for our pedestrians, for our kids, for our central workers. Um, and there are some exciting projects coming along, but your voice is so critical. You know your neighborhood, your streets, your street corners, and crossings better than any of us. And so uh, appreciate those of you joining us here tonight um, and definitely recommend if you haven't yet, I know Nicole will talk about it, filling out the surveys and sharing your feedback um, because we do take that very seriously as we make a safer um, active Fairfax. Um, so. Thank you, and um, thank you for leading the meeting tonight. Nicole, take it away. Thank you, Supervisor. All right, let's uh, dive right into the agenda for tonight's meeting. So before we get started uh, with the, the actual meeting topic, uh, we will cover some of the logistics for today's meeting. Obviously, we wanted to you know, meet with you in person uh, when we got uh, this project started to have you know, these uh, great interactions in a, in a community setting, looking at maps together, but unfortunately we can't do that um, due to the pandemic right now. So we are boarding, meeting virtually. Um, however, we would still would like to have um, a lively conversation with you and uh, this software we're using uh, will hopefully make this possible. So, so you will be able to, uh, to speak or um, write your uh, comments in the chat. So we go over some of um, the ways on how to participate tonight. And then we will dive into uh, the nuts and bolts of what is active transportation, what are active transportation facilities, and then have a discussion after each segment on pedestrians, on um, bicycling and uh, hiking, mountain biking and equestrian issues. Um, so we can you know, share, um, uh, you can share your thoughts and, and we can listen to your concerns and, and your ideas. Um, before we uh, start to um, um, talk a little bit more about uh, what the project is about and some of the, the, the timeline and the goals of the project. Uh, and in the end, we will have another um, few minutes to uh, ask questions um, and uh, have another discussion about anything that we hadn't covered yet um, before we uh, um, uh, close the meeting off. So let's get started with the meeting logistics. Uh, this meeting is recorded. Sorry, I should have mentioned that in the beginning. So this um, recording will be available at uh, the project website, which is on um, www.fairfaxcounty.gov slash transportation slash bike dash walk slash active Fairfax. You can also just uh, search for active Fairfax one word on uh, the Fairfax County website or on Google and it will get you to the project page. If you would like to ask a question during our um, presentation or during the Q&A uh, session, uh, you can type your question in into the WebEx Q&A feature, which you can find at the bottom right of your screen. And you can type the question anytime um, and then we will read it um, when, when we get to the point of having uh, the discussion. If you would like to answer a question and participate in the discussion, um, you can use the WebEx chat feature 
And the chat feature will allow um, everyone to see each other's comments. Um, the Q and A feature will only send the questions to the panelists, so you won't see them until the question has been answered. So we encourage you to use the chat, um, the chat feature, which is also on your bottom right. Um, if you don't see it yet, it will pop up by the time we get to to that discussion section. Um, but the, the best way to participate tonight is to uh, to answer a question verbally, to discuss verbally. Uh, you're currently muted, um, but we, if you would like to speak, please uh, raise your hand um, using the raise your hand button uh, that you can find on the lower right of your screen as well. It's like a tiny little hand that you can press, and then we can unmute you. And uh, please, everyone, take your hand down again when you're done and you don't have another question. If you're calling in tonight, uh, you can uh, also raise your hand um, so we can put you in the queue by pressing star three and star three for raising your hand, but also taking it back down again. All right, so let's get started on uh, the topic um, of today's uh, meeting, which is active transportation in Fairfax County. So first, um, you know, we want to have the, the same definition, the same place to start before we start discussing. Um, so what is active transportation? So active transportation is defined as part of this project as um, to include all forms of non-motorized self-propelled travel. And that is for recreational purposes and transportation purposes. And that can include um, modes such as walking, riding a, a bike or a horse, um, hiking, running, or rolling, and for example, in a wheelchair, on a scooter, or in a stroller. And the the uh, exception to the non-motorized self-propelled rule is uh, that this definition inc also includes um, electric micro mobility vehicles, and those are, for example, electric scooters, electric bikes, or electric skateboards, which are becoming more and more popular. And the key is here that they're actually using um, the active transportation infrastructure, so they can be in bike lanes or on. Um, sidewalks so are often legally defined as um, active transportation users um, and have very similar needs. So now we are going to take a look at the active transportation facilities that we can plan for as part of this effort. So first we're going to look at pedestrian facilities, then at bicycle facilities, and last we're going to look at hiking, mountain biking, and equestrian facilities. So pedestrian facilities are pretty straightforward. Um, it, those are sidewalks and sidewalks come in different widths. So on the left here, you see a wider sidewalk in an urban area, um, which also has uh, some seating and lighting and, this, uh, and um, a street tree here, uh, which is a very um, you know, um, nice place to walk and stroll. And then we have, um, uh, more narrow sidewalks uh, outside of these uh, more urban commercial centers. Um, those are uh, safe facilities that um, are really designed to accommodate um, all abilities. So the, the sidewalk width is actually determined by the needs of uh, a wheelchair user to pass uh, another person or to turn around. And then there are crosswalks, and this is where it becomes a little bit more complicated. So crosswalks can um, uh, look very different. So on the left here is a graphic that shows three types of the most common crosswalks in Fairfax County. So what's labeled here as number one is a uh, standard marked crosswalk with two parallel lines, and those are often found at signalized intersections. And then number two here is uh, something called a high visibility crosswalk. It's a lot more uh, paint, so it's more reflective, more visible, uh, and also often used at um, uh, near schools or near metro stations, and when there there are higher pedestrian volumes. And then there's a third type of crosswalk, which is an unmarked crosswalk. So there are no lines on the pavement, but there are curb ramps, and there it's at an intersection. So legally, all these crosswalks have the same. Uh, the pedestrians have the same rights and responsibilities using these facilities, but it's not widely known that an unmarked crosswalk is also a crosswalk. And then on the right here is uh, something that's called the mid block crosswalk. So this crossing is between two intersections. It's maybe a trail crossing, or there is um, some other reason why pedestrians would like to cross here, such as maybe a park entrance or a bus stop. 
And those are usually uh, done in the high visibility marking um, um, method. So, so it's more visible uh, since drivers will necessarily expect a uh, pedestrian to cross here. And there are also pedestrian um, crosswalk signs um, on, and sometimes on both sides of the road to alert drivers to, to watch out for pedestrians. Then we have um, a crosswalk enhancement. So safer crosswalk that have uh, a little bit of an extra. So uh, on the left here, um, this crosswalk includes a pedestrian refuge island. And that island allows uh, a pedestrian to cross one uh, direction of travel at a time, which can make it a lot more efficient because they don't have to wait for that safe gap on both sides. Um, and it provides uh, a safe space to wait in the middle. Then on the right here is uh, a, a pretty new um, technology uh, to Fairfax County that we have implemented um, recently um, in a couple locations. And this is called a rectangular rapid flashing beacon or RFB. And it's a little bit hard to see in this photo, but there are little lights right under this pedestrian warning sign and it can be activated by a push button and then they start flashing really rapidly, hence the name. Um, and they are very visible to drivers approaching this crosswalk and they know there are pedestrians either waiting to cross or already in the crosswalk so they can watch out for it. They also alert drivers behind this, uh, the car in the front that stopped why that car stopped so they don't try to pass it um, because uh, they know there are pedestrians crossing in front of the car. However, it's important to know that this is not a signalized crosswalk. So it doesn't give the pedestrian the right of way. So the pedestrian legally still has to wait for a safe gap in traffic before they're allowed to enter the roadway. Once they're in the crosswalk, the driver has to yield and stop for pedestrians in the crosswalk, but um, pedestrians should take due care to, to not cross right in front of a car. Then we have signalized crosswalks. Um, these are, of course, very, very um, frequently used in Fairfax County at uh, the most of the vast majority of signalized intersections have at least uh, two or three of these signalized um, crosswalks that pro provide the pedestrian with a protected crossing. So all the cars have to stop um, with the exception of the right turning vehicle, which it has, um, they're supposed to yield to the pedestrians um, before they can pass. And those are usually uh, activated by a push button, but in some uh, cases, for example, along Reston Parkway in Reston, um, the, the walk sign comes up uh, automatically, um, and that way pedestrians don't have to uh, push the button. On the right here is, uh, again, a new technology that we can now use in Fairfax County uh, that actually allows us to signalize um, mid-block uh, crossings. So previously we used um, quote unquote normal traffic lights for that, but this one is a specific one for a pedestrian crosswalk. Um, it does stop the cars, it is push button activated, and it allows a, a pedestrian to cross safely. Um, and it's best used at um, across busy streets where just a regular crosswalk would not be safe enough. And then we have a uh, great separated infrastructure that we can plan for. So those are uh, pedestrian bridges and pedestrian tunnels. And those can be used by bikes and pads, um, often used to cross uh, major roads like a highway um, or another barrier like a, a train track or a river. Um, so these are really great shortcuts um, if you know uh, this barrier would not allow an at grade crossing. Um, and tunnels here are, are uh, sometimes used when uh, trails are going along stream beds, or uh, in this case, um, this one is in Reston. Uh, it was designed as part of a, a network of trails under busy roads. So now we would like to hear your thoughts on uh, your experience uh, being a pedestrian in the Providence District or elsewhere in Fairfax County, um, or if you like to go running or strolling. Um, you can share any any uh, any thoughts with us. We're here to listen and, and learn from your experience. So if you would like to speak, uh, please raise your hand. Um, if you're calling in um, as a reminder, please press star three to raise your hand, or you can place your comment or question um, in the chat. So we have our first question. Um, does the county use raised crosswalks? 
Yes, so thank you for the question. Uh, JR used as part of uh, the Fairfax County Traffic Calming Program um, that is uh, available to um, neighborhoods and it's community driven process and as part of those tools to, to calm traffic on the roads that qualify in neighborhoods. It's mostly through through streets that see heavier traffic and now that many drivers have um, ways and other GPS that, that guides them through neighborhoods to get to a destination faster in order to slow those cars down. Uh, we can uh, use treatments uh, such a, as a raised crosswalk um, uh, for that purpose. Uh, we usually cannot use those, uh, you know, on on um, higher speed roads or uh, where we have uh, high turning movements. For example, we have looked at adding them at, uh, you know, those free for free for right turns. And some communities do add them there, but um, uh, as you may know, our roads are uh, owned and maintained by um, the state by VDOT. Um, so we will need to work with VDOT on these type of situations, but they're definitely a, a key tool in our toolbox for certain locations. Okay, uh, our first hand raiser, uh, Riyadh, uh, you're unmuted. Okay, uh, do you hear me? Yes. All right, great guys. Thank you so much. Uh, now I have a, a few points actually that I would like to make. Uh, is there like a specific amount of time that I'm allowed to, or how does that work? Um, go ahead. So we have about 10 minutes for the segment. Um, so please feel free to share your thoughts. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cause actually it's in uh, related to the bicycling and the path that you guys are uh, kindly provided information on this evening. Uh, so mm -hmm. just briefly, let me. I tell you who I am. My name is uh, Riyad Dawsi, and I'm a uh, president of the Pinery Civic uh, Association, and uh, that uh, englobes like around 380 homes. And uh, the reason being tonight is uh, so uh, the, our community is served by the Mason and Providence District Supervisors and three Virginia House delegates. And since some of the residents of Prosperity MU are in the Mason District, uh, hopefully FCDOT will see that our recommendation will be considered. And even though they're not in the problem district, so, uh, the reserve of the Pine Ridge Civic Association. Uh, are close to, uh, as you know, mosaic district, the Jerry Connick trail, the Providence recreation center, Thomas Jefferson libraries. We have 2 CVS pharmacies, you can community park. 3 places of worship, dry cleaner, convenience stores, everything very close to us. Uh, while these counties services are and shops are very close to our residents. Uh, they cannot at this time walk or bicycle to them. Interstate 495 has presented prevented the Pine Ridge uh, uh, resident from safely walking and bicycling to the county library and recreation center since they were built. And also, the lack of a sidewalk along Prosperity Avenue forces residents to drive rather than uh, walking or bicycling. And as you know, a lot of people would like to do so. So I have just a few points, if I could. We are very pleased that Fairfax County is seeking community suggestion for additional sidewalks and share use path recommendation. At our April 7 uh, Civic Association meeting, I was asked to present the following suggested improvement to the active Fairfax plan. So the first one is sidewalk on Prosperity Avenue between Arlington Boulevard and Little River Turnpike. The existing side path from Crestview to Arlington Boulevard does not meet current standard. No safe walking or bicycling access to the Eakin Community Park and the Jerry only cross county trail. There's also no safe uh, walking, bicycling access to the possessed Jewish community center, uh, along with no safe access to the two pharmacies, the restaurant, the dry cleaner, the convenience, and the three local places of worship that are very close. And it would be very nice if we could use something else in the car. Prosperity Avenue improvement will connect with the Arlington Boulevard Trail that is funded and now under design. The improvement were included in the prior trail plan. However, Fairfax County never built them. Second, shared use path and bridge connecting Highland Lane to Monarch Lane. The connection will provide safe access from PRCA to Eakin Community Park and the CCT via Monarch Lane. The connection would provide also safe access, easy access to the Prosperity High community. And the improvement was included in the prior trail plan. However, Fairfax County never built them yet. Bicycle and pedestrian bridge crossing I-95 North or Route 50 connecting Fair, Fairview Park North with Gate Road Trail to the Mosaic District. 
This crossing and related trail connection is part of the Capital Trail Coalition, coalition Network. The improvement was accredited in the prior trail plan, not yet built. Hopefully, we'll see it in the future. Bicycle, uh, uh, fourth one, bicycle and pension bridge crossing I 95 South or Route 50 connected, connecting Firm View Park South with the Pine Ridge Civic Association service area. Crossing will provide Percia residents with bicycling access to the local county library and recreation center. Crossing will also allow Mason District residents to bicycle to Inova, Fairfax, and the Mosaic. The improvement was included in the Pine Trail, but yet not yet built. So lastly, uh, however, we do not support the taking of any property by eminent domain in order to provide these or any of sidewalk trail. We believe that the use of eminent domain needs to be evaluated on a case by case basis. If the county should consider eminent domain to obtain land, property owners must be notified if their land is actually in this plane. We are concerned that some county easements that provide access, connectivity to park, etc., are not shown in this map. We request that this pathway be included in this study and on this map. Thank you so much for the opportunity to prevent our view and concern. And the PRC asked the FCDOT to include our recommendation improvement in the active Fairfax transportation plan, and they be finding the build at the earliest possible time. Guys, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for sharing all the very detailed information. This is really great uh, local input, um, hyper local. So thank you for for pointing out all these issues. Uh, and please, if you could, could if you could email me um, those suggestions as well at activefairfax at fairfaxcounty.gov. So have them written down so we can you know share them with the consultant. Um, and I, I try to take notes, but it would be helpful. To yeah, that's a question question. as well. <laughs> <laughs> and we all should do so. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank uh -huh. you. All right, we have a few more hands raised. Yes, we, we got lots of hands. Uh, also, remember, once you're done, please put your hand down so I can keep track of. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no worries. Uh, next up, uh, Wendy Hoskins. Hi, thank you so much for this opportunity. I've just got, I've got a couple things to point out. I live uh, in Falls Church, an uh, older neighborhood, and luckily I have live on a street with sidewalks on both sides. And it's great. And even before the pandemic, a lot of people walk there. I have a dog, so I'm always out walking. Um, I just really want to encourage um, the, uh, I, whoever deals with developers and new uh, new properties that are, that are being uh, built um, to encourage them to put in or make them put in sidewalks. I mean, especially now, so many people are out and sort of discovered how great it is to walk around the neighborhood and sidewalks just make it so much safer. Um, that's my point number one, because I know near where I live, there is a new development going in. It's next to Shrevewood Elementary off of Shreve Road, and I think Remington is the, the other outlet. So that's number one. Number two is Shreve Road, which is uh, another place where I do a lot of walking because I live uh, near there. And there is a, uh, there's actually two sections, but one in particular, pretty close to the school, where the sidewalk is very narrow, and it's not really a sidewalk, it's like a path, right? But it's it's uh it's next to the road and it's maybe 18 inches from the highway from this road. And you know, Shree Road is 35 miles an hour. So there are cars coming from all the time. And I am so nervous, I will not walk on that section. This is between Fairwood Lane and Holly Manor. So of course, kids in Holly Manor walking to the school, you know, you're walking on this part of road, which is very close to the highway. And you know, people drive. It's 35, but you know they drive a little bit higher than that too sometimes. Um, so I, of course, cross the road to go to the other side, which is also not particularly safe because it's a pretty busy road and the cars are going pretty fast. So anyways, uh, that's just, I want to point that out. That is a particular area that I feel is really bad. And I know that the Shreve Road Group has, uh, and uh, Virginia DOT has put together a really nice plan. And I know there's lots of stuff in it, but that to me is just kind of a, danger feeling sort of place. Uh, okay, um, thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much, Wendy, for sharing uh, those concerns. And we took note of them and, and we'll, we'll follow up on them. Thank you. All right, we have a few more hands. So I want to make sure to, to get uh, through all of them. Um, so this is really meant to be, you know, you tell us uh, your thoughts. Um, 
um, and if there if there um, is something to clarify, we're happy to respond. But it's really about listening to you, uh, giving us information. So I just want to make sure we get to to everyone. Um, so maybe we can go to Chris next. Okay, go for it. Okay, hi Nicole, thank you. Um, so. Um, I guess one thing I wanted to ask was, I believe the Virginia legislature recently passed a law allowing residential uh, streets to have speed limits that are lower than posted lower than 25 miles per hour without the need for costly speed studies. Um, can you speak to how and when VDOT would make this option available to Providence district residents? Um, you know, vehicle speeds are really one of the biggest barriers to providing safe active transportation. Opportunities and then more of a comment. I would suggest that VDOT, as part of this process, uh, rethink, come up with a new means of um, determining uh, speed limits um, and uh, appropriate speed limits on our residential streets. The process, current process, is a, a bit crazy. I think um, drivers seem to be able to set the rules themselves. So my concerns are primarily driving speed. And I just had a question about this new law. Thank you. And thank you for bringing that up um, and speed uh, of drivers in general. And yeah, it's a great opportunity to now have the ability um, to lower the speed limits uh, below 25. I'm not sure if we uh, have uh, established a process already within VDOT or what VDOT stand is on, on the process. So Nicole, I'll, I'll go ahead and take that one. This is Tom yeah. Shigeman, yeah. the director of Fairfax County's Department of Transportation. You're correct that the the General Assembly did pass uh, legislation that will go into effect on July 1st that does allow um, local governments, particularly counties, some flexibility in uh, reducing speed limits. Uh, we're waiting for the guidance on that. Um, VDOT will be establishing specific guidance on how that process will work. And as soon as we get it, we will review, review that. Um, I'm sure there'll be discussions with our Board of Supervisors and then we'll uh, proceed um, to to try and implement the, the the law using the guidance. So um, we don't have that guidance yet, but it is something that we're looking for um, to receive probably within the next month or two. Thank you. All right, let's go to David. Can you hear me? Yes, hi. Can now. Thank you for having thank you for having us uh, go through this. This is a this is a great uh, way to get some information to each other and hopefully my neighbors as well. I do I live on Allen Avenue here in Poplar Heights. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to talk some something that's been uh, on the docket with Fairfax County for a while for several supervisors now um, is the Allen Avenue cut through and the necessity for a sidewalk to be put in for several reasons. Uh, I've been in the neighborhood about 20 years or so on and off with my family. We own several homes on, on, in Allen, on Allen Avenue, actually. And uh, we've had a lot more kids now moving in the neighborhood. And they, you know, they stand out in the street. There's no sidewalk. There's a connecting sidewalk on West and Buckaloo. And if you're on the other side, on the Woodley side of the neighborhood, that heads out to, to Lee Highway, uh, this is a great way to connect uh, the Woodley side or West Street over to Buckaloo so people can get down to the trail, especially joggers. And there's quite a few now since uh, the pandemic and walkers, uh, even people on bikes. Um, we've had several traffic studies and it's shown the traffic on the street. But I'm, I'm kind of want to hear from uh, VDOT uh, representative for the county here too, because they, they've looked at this location several times for several improvement reasons. I just want to see where they are with that. And uh, if we're going to be able to get a sidewalk put in soon, kind of to remedy some of this, because we all know that nobody's, nobody goes the speed limit on this road. Um, because it's extra wide, so they tend to go pretty fast. And I'm looking at the old, the last uh, study we had was over 342 um, cut through trips in a peak hour. Um, and I just want to figure out: is there a way that we could slow that down or, or, or remove some of these cars off this street, as well as add the sidewalk to connect to get down to the Poplar Heights pool, to get down to the trail, and just kind of connect the trail so people can walk instead of having to drive through here. Uh, or run or, or bike. Uh, it just seems like logical there should be a sidewalk to connect the two sides because there's sidewalks on both sides. There's just no sidewalk down Allen, which makes no sense because this this cut through is pretty heavily trafficked and it's pretty dangerous. Even just to walk to the corner, it gets pretty dangerous. And that's why I was looking at raised, um, the possibility of raised crosswalks 
something to slow people down when they're taking the turn from West Street into into Allen. That's something that needs to be looked at, as well as um, people running the stop sign over the Woodley and Allen Avenue cross. And then the Buckaloo turn as well. Buckaloo turning in also is a, is a really quick turn that people cut short. And if people are walking or coming in from the trail, it gets really dangerous. Um, so that's that's one of the things that I, I'm hoping that you guys can look at in further detail and just update us because we've had several studies now and a lot of money been spent uh, that has proven that this this needs to be improved. Thank you. Thank you for Thank sharing you. that concern. Um, just one note on uh, gaps in the infrastructure. Um, there, there is a process the county uh, utilizes to um, you note know, down those those gaps. There's uh, you can send us you know, that information via email, and we will add uh, those sidewalks um, that are currently uh, you know not not implemented yet to a list uh, of unfunded projects. So the county. Um, just funded uh, a significant amount of uh, new sidewalks a few years ago that we're uh, working down. So all that funding is encumbered until at least uh, 2026. But we are taking down uh, notes for for missing sidewalks for the next round of funding to be considered. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and to anyone else that, that would like to submit these type of requests, that can be submitted via email to the county. And add it to the list, uh, or you can um, notify your supervisor as well. Thank you. Sure. We have uh, two more hands, and I think there are also some some comments in the chat. Let's go with Fran. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Um, okay, Fran, you're unmuted. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to thank you first for getting the community input on adding and improving trails and paths in the county. One thing that you should be aware of is that some folks have taken this process or this opportunity uh, to do a lot of trespassing. So they go on people's properties and they look to see if there's a way to find a connection that makes sense for their community. And I understand why they're doing that but it might be a good idea if you could remind people that, uh, that you are not giving them permission to trespass, and that's what they're doing. They, they also come on the property and they, and they dig up plants, and when you question them about the plants, they say things like, well, this is parkland, so I'm entitled. Well, you know, whether it's parkland or private land, they're not entitled, and that's stealing. So somehow or other, we have to get the message across that, yes, filling in these blanks is a good idea, but there's the right way to do it and the wrong way to do it. And I'm um, especially concerned because I understand now that uh, in some cases, you're looking at eminent domain for uh, taking of property in order to provide some of these things. Uh, so I think it's important that the people whose property you're looking at, be aware that this is happening. So maybe there's a way to try to put a little blurb on your website that makes it clearer that you're not authorizing people to trespass and that things should be done respectfully in that arena. Um, there are a couple of other things I wanted to mention. Uh, you talked about the pedestrian bridge. In some cases, we have proffers that um, have designated funding for some of these things. What are you folks going to do to ensure that uh, when the time comes for funding of something, you check and make sure you get that proffer money in part of your planning? Uh, you know, people work very hard to get that proffer money, and we'd like to see it used for the right purpose. But if it if it's not on the list that that proper money is available, uh, you may try to fund the whole thing with county funding when there is some backup uh, available to you. So if you could try to uh, give us a little bit of an understanding as to how that would work. Um, the other piece is, you know, my understanding of this process is you're trying to determine what pieces Fairfax County is going to pay for. Um, however, you have the county has easements that are not on the map. 
they are public access easements. Um, they don't show up on the map. Are you folks aware that these are there? Uh, how do we go to what do we what can we do to help you um, know where these pieces are and to make sure that they are considered in whatever process you're going through? And then lastly, the fact that we have some major projects here and I can understand you want it to fund those because that's where most of the people are going to be uh, walking or biking and so on. But we shouldn't forget the little projects in the neighborhoods that allow people to get to the amenities that are around us. And maybe this should be split up in two ways for a funding standpoint that there's some funding available for these smaller projects. My concern is that all the money will go for the larger projects in the neighborhoods would be without the connectivity that they need to enjoy the amenities. And then last, uh, please make sure you consider maintenance when you're putting all of this together because that's a, an important part. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, for your uh, comments and sharing your concerns. Uh, and first of all, I'm sorry to to hear that that um, someone trespassed um, to to find a connection for prep. It's certainly not the intent, and um, it's a, a digital map that that folks can fill out. But maybe someone took it a little bit too literal and and uh, is exploring uh, where connections could be made, um, and that's certainly not the intent. And um, uh, we can see if that if if uh, that needs to be addressed uh, on the map with like a little blurb. Um, just a little other, reminder, yeah. right? Not not to not to take that, um, you know, the, the planning uh, of the trail uh, too far. <laughs> right. So this is a high level uh, look at you know where potential uh, um, con connectivity is missing, and it would be uh, as part of the um, implementation stage, um, and also the, the planning and implementation stage to to take a look at. Uh, we we use JS where we see property. Uh, uh, borders and see where where there is public right away. Um, so so that's what we use to to uh, determine if you know a trail could could fit in there. Um, so I'm I'm not sure if Tom wants wants to address the uh, question on the funding piece. Sure, thank you, um, yeah. Nicole. Just a, a couple of feedback on that. So first of all, on the proffer piece, um, we do have a record of all the proffers that have been made. Uh, particularly for trails and sidewalks, and that is part of our process. So as we're developing a new pro uh, new project, um, one of the things, one of the checks that we do is we go back to that list of uh, past proffers and make sure that if there is a proffer in that general area, that we're incorporating it, that funding into the project, <clears throat> so right. that we do yeah. take advantage of that. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to just comment on very quickly is the, the comment about eminent domain and um, this, this effort is really to identify the plan, um, what improvements are needed in the future. And then there'll be a separate effort that actually begins to implement the projects. And as part of that effort um, in, in any individual project, um, we may have to acquire a right of way. But the county always um, works to do that through a negotiation process to the maximum extent possible. And so it's only after negotiations have been exhausted that we would consider um, uh, using eminent domain. And, and that's really on the, the individual project side. And that really isn't directly related to this effort, which is really to develop the plan. So I wanted to just reassure people that um, we are not, that that's the last course of action. And, and certainly um, we are a long way away from acquiring property for any of the things that are going to come out of this plan. Can I do a follow up there? How are, what is the county gonna to do to ensure that the people know that a project is being considered for their property. So we go through a process when we're when we're evaluating pro projects for what we call the transportation priority plan. And as part of that plan, we we make an initial outreach to to prioritize the projects, 
and then we have community input to allow um, people to react to that to say, yes, we, we agree that these are good projects or no, there are other projects that should be funded. And so we do go through a significant public outreach process when we're in the project selection piece, which is different. That's when we're actually got money and we're implementing projects, which is different than this effort, which is just to identify where projects should even be considered. So there would be a public outreach effort before any projects uh, would would go forward into a transportation priority plan. Well, I, I, I guess I won't dwell on this, but my concern is the public outreach is great, but how do you know that you've reached the person whose property you, you could possibly impact? That's where my concern is. That's uh, where we would be talking with people specifically once a project has been funded and, and is moving forward. We will likely be talking to every individual person that's been affected or potentially affected by by the project. Okay. So there'll be so, multiple multiple levels, but we probably need to move on. We've got a couple other people that um, okay. are waiting to uh, raise their comments. Thank you, Fran. Thank you. All right, let's take one more minute. This is a great discussion, and thank you so much for your participation. Um, we do have a couple more chances to to discuss, and I, I want to make sure that we we get to the bicycle issues and some of the other issues as well. So let's take one. Um, one maybe question from the chat. Uh, sure. Um, so, uh, in the chat, um, Paul wrote, uh, why isn't there more focus on crosswalks or lack thereof in current existing intersections? So, uh, that's a great question. Um, so there, there, are. uh, was an approach to um, including crosswalks at signalized intersections to uh, only have uh, one crosswalk um, across the main line for a while. This is changing now. We are, we are uh, as a county, are asking um, BDA to to include um, four crosswalks uh, at each intersection that is signalized, um, and sometimes it works out, and sometimes it doesn't for for a variety of reasons. Um, however, there are, there are many intersections, particularly neighborhoods, where crosswalks um, are, uh, and, and I assume you're referring to the marked crosswalks, because every intersection has four crosswalks or three, depending on the type of intersection, uh, but they're not necessarily marked. Um, so, VDOT um, has a certain warrants uh, that need to be met in order to mark um, crosswalks at intersections, and particularly within neighborhoods. Uh, they're often not meeting warrants um, because of you know, the, the reasons listed um, uh, in the VDA road design manual. All right, let's move on to the um, bicycle um, facilities um, because I want to make sure we get through to that and then also have time to um, talk about the project itself. Um, so, so just uh, if I could, sorry, if I could just jump in with a quick note. Uh, if we were okay. able to get to you this time around, um, please do put your hand down. If if you had your hand up, please keep it raised, and we'll be sure to start with you uh, in the next section. Thank you, David. So bicycle facilities are a little bit more complex than than uh, pedestrian facilities. There are many different options that uh, are available to transportation planners to accommodate. Um, um, bicyclists either um, on the road or off street. Uh, so let's look at the on road bicycle facilities first. So here we have uh, the most basic one, which is a shared street. Um, on the left is the most ideal shared street, which is uh, uh, low traffic, um, low speeds, uh, and no markings at all, uh, which uh, encourages drivers usually to drive more towards the middle of the road. Um, and leave space for pedestrians to the left or right, but overall it's pretty good uh, uh, shared space and doesn't really need uh, much additional treatment except maybe some wayfinding. Um, on the right here is a shared street that is already slightly less comfortable. So there we have the double yellow that pushes the cars to each uh, side of the road where now the, the cyclists and the vehicles are sharing the same lane. Um, and in order to alert the drivers to expect cyclists in the lane and to alert cyclists to um, where the safest place to be is within that lane, uh, we can add those shared lane markings or sharrows. 
Then we have um, bicycle lanes, which are very common in Fairfax County now. We have over 100 miles of these. Um, uh, those provide a designated space for cyclists um, away from the travel lane. Um, and that's uh, often preferred by both the cyclists and the drivers um, because the cyclists can go at their own speed. Um, and we either have bike lanes in both directions, which is the ideal case. And sometimes we only have it in one direction if there wasn't enough space uh, when we retrof retrofitted the road as part of the paving process, for example, with bike lanes. On the right here is something called the buffered bike lane, which is um, um, a standard bike lane with an extra buffer painted next to it, and it could be between two feet wide or eight feet wide, depending on the available space. And the wider the buffer, the more comfortable the bike facility is going to be for the cyclist. And we have off street facilities. So, off street facilities are fully protected from vehicles and appeal to a great amount of people uh, for that reason. So, those are very common in Fairfax County as well. Um, we have uh, about 500 miles uh, of uh, these paved shared trails that were designed for bikes. Some are older, a little bit more narrow. The newer ones are nice and wide and flat. Um, and they could either go along roads within right away or through our many uh, beautiful parks in Fairfax County. And we're also planning at, um, to create these type of facilities in more urban environments, and that's a newer thing. So the, the image you see on the left here uh, is actually in Indianapolis, um, but a type facility like that is planned for Tyson's um, as well as uh, downtown McLean. So this is a new thing that we are um, um, working towards in a really popular facility where it already exists around the country. And then we have separated bikeways. So those function like bike lanes, but they are uh, completely separated from traffic, um, usually at the intersection as well. I have their own signal and those um, are uh, different from a shared use path and that they provide a parallel sidewalk. So pedestrians and cyclists are separated as well. So all users have their own space, uh, which allows um, uh, cyclists to go a little bit faster and move um, you know, very efficiently uh, and safely uh, along the corridor while pedestrians can walk at their own pace without you know, being um, too close to, to the faster cyclists. And those could be either uh, two way facilities as is shown on the left or a uh, one way facility as is shown on the right. And then how we do, how do we determine what is the best bike facility? And um, we are moving away from uh, just focusing on on street facilities to, to looking at uh, primarily off street facilities because we know it serves more people. Um, and this is called the, uh, the all ages and abilities facilities. And this a little comic strip kind of shows the difference between, you know, there, there are cyclists actually using the on street facilities, um, even on the high speed roads and thinking, you know, it's not that bad. While a lot of people that are interested in biking don't feel comfortable using those. However, if they um, have access to uh, a, a wide and uh, protected facility, um, that even children can ride on, all cyclists are being served, including the, the one cyclist that was um, comfortable riding on those facilities before. And this graphic kind of shows how uh, this, uh, our population breaks down into these different type of cyclists that have different needs. So we have a small uh, part of the population that is the highly confident cyclist that I really don't need many facilities and sometimes prefer to actually ride with car traffic and not in bike lanes, depending on the uh, design condition of the bike lane. Then we have uh, quite experienced cyclists um, that are more comfortable in bike lanes uh, or wouldn't necessarily share the road with busy traffic. Uh, but then the biggest uh, part of the population, 51 to 56 percent, um, actually prefer the full separation and that's more than half of the population. So this, it makes sense to, to look at all these different needs and plan accordingly. So now we have um, the chance to, to open it up uh, for you to um, share your experience uh, riding a bike in Fairfax County or scooter or on another small micro mobility vehicle. So again, if you would like to speak, please raise your hand. Um, if you're calling in, please press star three to raise your hand, or you can use the chat or QA. All right, so we got some hands up already. Uh, thanks to your patience uh, from last time. First up is Gail. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yup. 
Okay, great. Hi, Nicole and, and Tom. Um, so, so I live on Tree Road, and there's a planned bike path and a planned hard surface trail that goes um, looks like right through my property. Um, so it goes from the W and um, the W O N or W N O D, excuse me, the W O N D bike path up to Route Seven, and I've been part of this these calls in the past and I've seen in the past and right across the street from us is a sidewalk. There's non residential area. There's a lot of land and in the past, the discussion was putting a bike path on that side of the street, putting, you know, transportation on that side of the street. Now it's switched over to the side where all the residences are. And um, so I think I'm one of those people that is going to be directly impacted. Never have been contacted saw this for the 1st time last night when I looked at the Esri interactive map. I think I'm, I, yeah, I'm very disappointed that the policy is to wait until the projects funded and moving forward and the homeowners that are impacted are not specifically notified that this is under consideration. Um, but I guess my question is, um, you know, why not have the path on the other side? What, what is it that you're looking at? How are you making those decisions? Um, are you looking at the impact to the homeowners? And um, I guess that's, that's my concern. And what's the process moving forward for a homeowner to raise concerns and issues? Thank you for bringing up this question. And I actually received an email about the specific um, um, path earlier today. So I had some, some time to look into it earlier. Um, so what you're seeing on the GIS map is the actual um, um, comprehensive plan guidance that has been there for years. So this is what's currently in the plan. This is not a new uh, facility that's being added as part of this uh, process. So that's something we will look at um, in phase two of this process. So right now we're just uh, showing you what, what is currently in the plan and asking for feedback. So thank you for, for that feedback. Um, and just just uh, as a, um, uh, a reminder that, that this is a comprehensive plan. So even if that trail was placed many, who knows how many years ago uh, on, on the uh, on that side of the residential side of uh, Shreve Road, um, it may have been a good reason. Maybe in the the, the plan is from the 70s, so it could have been as old as the 1970s. That it looked maybe that neighborhood wasn't even there at that time, um, and or maybe the the border to the city was not something they wanted to address, and that's why they placed it there. But it's just a comprehensive planning guidance at the high level. So which side of the road a trail? gets implemented uh, will be looked at when the funding is available and uh, we're moving into the, the concept stage and scoping the project, looking at the comprehensive plan, what was the guidance. But the point is to, to provide a, a, an off street um, bike and pet facility along this corridor. And even though the site is specified on one side, if the other side makes the most sense, we do have that flexibility to, to, to switch to the other side. So surveys will be done so we see what what which side is the best one. We do that frequently when we implement. So sorry about the confusion that this may have added, but this is not a new, new suggestion. And as part of if funding becomes available to implement this project, um, it, it would go on the side where where uh, it has uh, the least impacts. Um, and, and it sounds like it's actually in this case, the other side potentially. And so how do I stay involved so that I'm part of that process that makes the business case for putting it on the other side of the street? So this sounds like this is maybe part of the Shreve Road um, corridor study, which is a separate um, study from this uh, project. And um, I believe there is a, um, there were community meetings and the website potentially for it. I'm not sure if Chris yes, or Tom is true. to jump in. Okay. Yes. So yeah, that's I mean, the best way in staying involved. And and the one thing I would add, and I'm sorry, this is Chris Wells um, uh, uh, with Nicole. Um, 
this is just phase one of the active Fairfax transportation plan where, where we are gathering community input, where we are uh, showing what is the current comprehensive plan. And then ultimately in phase two of this process uh, will be the recommendations for uh, the updated plan. So, uh, for to answer your question about how you stay involved, you know, uh, you know, stay involved with what the activities associated with the active Fairfax transportation plan uh, and moving forward uh, in the interest of time. I, I want to be brief. Um, the, the current plan for some magisterial districts has which side of the street it was recommended on and in other magisterial districts. It doesn't. So, like Nicole said, uh, that's. Uh, 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 the idea at the time that the plan was uh, uh, put into that level of detail, but ultimately, uh, it, it, when we build a project, you know, we absolutely look at connectivity, buildability, engineering issues, and trying to minimize impacts, which which minimizes cost. But uh, we anticipate we're not funded yet for phase two, but we anticipate moving into phase two uh, between you know twenty at the year 2021, 2022, and that's when we would come back to the public with um, uh, the proposed uh, updated network. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let's go to um, Chris. Oh, I think, um, so I think I saw that uh, Paul had his hand up. Paul, did you wanna, did you wanna speak or? Or not. Put his hand down again. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, Chris, you're up. Okay. Thanks. Uh, hi again. Um, I'll keep it uh, relatively brief. I just wanted to sort of um, verify your earlier slides about the different um, comfort levels of cyclists in the Providence District. So I, I guess I'm the confident type, but also frequently terrified type. Um, over the last couple of weeks in Providence District, I've ridden my bike to the Oakton Library, to the Oakton Community Park, to the Nottoway Park. I rode to the community center for a vaccine. I've been to Lowe's, I've been shopping, right? And so I use my bike whenever I can, but I have almost no bicycle facilities, on-road bicycle facilities of which to speak of to use. So I'm riding in the street. Um, and none of those activities, despite that they're all within three miles, four miles of my home, would any member of my family or any of my neighbors neighbors ever attempt? Um, even riding less than a mile to Oakton Shopping Center is not something that most of my neighbors would do. So you, if you are really trying to encourage active, active transportation, the types of um, bicycle infrastructure that the county is has been implementing, which are lines of paint on the road, is not sufficient. Um, I would say buffered bike lanes are not sufficient. We need physically separated bicycle infrastructure that people of all ages and abilities can use if you're really interested in sort of moving the needle um, on active transportation. And so, you know, I certainly appreciate the bike lanes that have been built to date, but my my family's not going to use them. Um, I appreciate them, but um, that's not, I don't think I'm the person that you guys should be trying to reach. So I just want to echo that um, in terms of this plan, I think, you need to look beyond the slides that you had to some of those slides that uh, required you to go outside of the county to find pictures, right? So some of the physically separated bicycle infrastructure, flexi posts, concrete barriers. Um, that's what the county needs to really uh, get people out and about and out of their cars. Um, and we really only have, not to change the subject too much, but in terms of the climate change and the county's plans and Supervisor Polchik's commitment to reducing carbon emissions, um, we need to do it soon. So. Thanks for the time to speak. Thank you, Chris, and thanks for sharing your your experience and concerns. Um, I want to um, uh, just uh, address uh, the thing you said in the in the end about you know we have to go outside the county to to find images of cycle tracks, and you're correct. We don't have a full corridor um, that is built with cycle tracks yet. We have pieces of it that were built by developers uh, since we had cycle tracks in our comprehensive plan since 2014. Um, but we, we are actually having um, three cycle tracks under um, in design, so they're not constructed yet, but they are funded and in design. They're not um, uh, in the Providence district, but in the Hunter Mill district in the Reston area. Uh, but those are basically pilot projects that we, we hope to implement others in, in um, 
uh, the urban areas in Fairfax County where those are uh, most appropriate. And as well as um, the Richmond Highway corridor has uh, um, the cycle tracks on both sides of the road in the plans, which is not a funded, a quite a funded project yet, uh, but that's the, the vision for that corridor. Um, but there are, there are many roads in um, the Providence district that would benefit from this type of facility. So thank you for mentioning that. All right, we have one more raised hand. Um, I think that's. Or is it yeah. a leftover? Um, okay. Yeah, did you have a, an additional comment or was that just a leftover hand raise? Oh, wait, I forgot to unmute her. <laughs> sorry. Oh, uh, Gail? oh, sorry, I should uh, uh, unraise my hand. I already spoke. Thanks. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. And do you have any uh, messages in the chat or the Q and A that we haven't addressed yet? Um, I'm uh, not seeing any. I think we can move on to the next section. Okay, great. All right. Um, there you go. So, uh, the next section is on hiking, mountain biking, and equestrian facilities. Um, and those are um, usually uh, more narrow natural surface trails that primarily uh, wind through our uh, natural parklands in Fairfax County. And we have many miles of these type of facilities already. They're extremely popular with the population, particularly now during uh, the pandemic. Um, people are, are uh, out and about exploring nature, wanting to connect to nature, and those are uh, uh, great facilities to, to do so. Um, yeah, on the right, we see some mountain biking uh, trail enhancements that, that can provide some additional obstacles uh, for more experienced riders as well. Uh, so we, we have currently uh, these type of trails in our um, county ride trails plan, um, but are also able to uh, uh, add additional connections, uh, both for recreational use, but also transportation use um, uh, to, to the plan in the future. So now we have um, a chance to specifically focus on, on the needs of hikers and mountain bikers and equestrians, if there are any in the audience. So if you would like to speak on those issues, um, please raise your hand or uh, place a question in the chat or your discussion point. Doesn't look like that is and that anyone would like to speak on this topic, so we can move on since I know we're already a bit short on time. Um, we'll yeah. make sure we get to the presentation um, before it gets too late. So uh, concrete streets is another topic um, that uh, will be addressed in, in the active effects transportation plan. So I just want to uh, show a quick example of what a concrete street is. Um, so uh, the basic concrete street would be one that accommodates all modes, so the pedestrians, the cyclists, um, as well as the drivers. However, a, a true concrete street does more than that. So it provides enhanced infrastructure um, amenities, uh, such as street trees, street lighting, and street furniture that takes uh, the you know the, the the experience of particular pedestrians and cyclists um, from. What we can see here on the on the left, uh, you know, we're getting from A to B um, to a real, real um, enjoyable experience um, and safe experience that uh, really, you know, induces um, pedestrian and bicycle trips, and that's something that you may be familiar with from the uh, Tyson Street standard. So that's something the county has already implemented in the urban areas in in the county. Um, in the mosaic district, um, you will see some of these, but that's also something we can do outside of, of urban areas, particularly in the, around the, um, you know, close to those centers uh, of activity so that uh, neighboring uh, residents can safely and conveniently and, and comfortably access the activity center um, um, from just outside the area, like a quarter mile away or half a mile away uh, on foot and bike. So let's look at uh, a little bit more about the plan. So we, we discussed a couple of those um, uh, 
um, building blocks uh, of the active transportation uh, network plans um, briefly as, as part of the conversation. So I just wanted to show uh, what those look like. So we have mentioned the countywide trails plan that you see on the left here, which the county has had since the 1970s. It's very comprehensive. So that trail on uh, along Shreve Road that was mentioned earlier would find on this plan as uh, a major paved trail. Um, there are also minor paved trails and hiking trails on this plan. And the original intent was to create a, um, a countywide, uh, well-connected um, network of off-street bicycle facilities um, and pedestrian facilities to for transportation and recreational purposes. So you see uh, pretty good connectivity to parks as well. Some sometimes even loop trails around uh, lakes. Um, so this was very well thought out with a lot of community participation, particularly in in your area of the county. And it's a great asset, but it's in need of updating. Now we have uh, the bicycle master plan, which was developed and adopted in uh, 2014, which fo focused primarily on on street facilities, such as bike lanes and sharrows and, and those um, uh, shared street connections. And it had a few off street trails that had uh, a lot of um, um, uh, were important for the transportation network for particular long distance bike commuters. So those two plans um, uh, were developed separately, um, don't necessarily uh, speak to each other. So sometimes we have a recommendation for an on-street facility right next to a recommendation for a trail facility. So so the the plan is to to merge those back into one map and um, look at all the, the recommendations and then pick the one that makes most sense for the corridors based on community feedback and best practices. As uh, someone in the audience said earlier, they don't feel comfortable on bike lanes and their family wouldn't use them. And that that is a, the best practice is moving away from bike lanes on busy roads, reserve them for lower speed, lower volume roads where they're still appropriate and still serve a lot of people. Um, but on, on most of our streets are very busy in, in the county um, and would, would require an officer facility to really serve a lot of people. Um, so merging those two plans together uh, makes sense at this stage. And then we have a special area plans for activity centers. Um, we mentioned Tyson, uh, but all the um, other activity centers in the county, such as Reston and Springfield, Annandale and downtown McLean have their own um, little um, um, uh, community special area plans, comprehensive plans that also have active transportation infrastructure um, recommendations that are not necessarily reflected in the trails plan and the bike plan. So sometimes we have three recommendations for one road. So this plan um, uh, goal is to um, make sure that all these plans align with each other and, and show the, the most desirable um, and context specific um, facility. Then we also have a, a, a new regional trail network plan, which is not a comprehensive plan. It's more of a regional vision that's shared between the jurisdictions and the DC area. And that's um, uh, driven by the Capital Trails Coalition that um, the jurisdictions are uh, uh, partners or members um, and they designated uh, planned or existing trails um, um, in, in the entire area that are connecting to each other. And the goal is to, to form this really uh, well thought or comprehensive off street network that will allow people in the uh, DC region to get around um, and explore the region by bike uh, between the activity centers, reach Metro and some of the major um, regional uh, destinations. And the trails you see in green are the existing trails in Fairfax County. Uh, here we have quite a lot of existing trails already. Um, and the orange trails are either planned or funded facilities. Um, but as part of this, effort, we would like to formalize this network, um, take it from this vision and actually add, add it to the comprehensive plan, but also enhance it. So you can see gaps, particularly uh, in, in your area here. Um, so the 495 trail is missing and some other uh, trails that are in our comprehensive plan, but didn't make it onto this regional trail network plan map, but it would make sense um, um, you know, to, to, to add to this network. So I mentioned some of the, the um, aspects that um, uh, launched the idea for this plan update. 
uh, the inconsistencies between the bike plan and the county road trails plan, the area plans, as well as uh, the duplication of having this many different plans, um, streamlining this process, but also uh, updating the design recommendation for the facilities to meet uh, national uh, best practices and um, uh, the, the current vision uh, for active transportation that the community um, is developing as part of this process. And then also we don't have a pedestrian uh, plan in the county yet. So having the trails plan and the bike plan uh, left the pedestrians out in it a little bit. So uh, making it an active transportation plan, uh, bringing the focus uh, equally on, on the different modes uh, on biking and, and pedestrian needs and um, needs of, of some of the other um, active transportation users uh, allows us to, to provide some design guidelines on crosswalks, for example, and other features that enhance the pedestrian experience and safety. And as uh, um, Chris or Tom mentioned earlier, this is a phase project. Um, we are currently in phase one, where we uh, do the community outreach um, to, to get input on, on current issues and, and thoughts uh, that the community has about active transportation and where we should go as a county. Um, but we also analyze the existing network that's on the ground, as well as demographics, uh, where the short car trips are that could be converted, where our current pedestrian and bicycle movements are. Um, and we also looked at the current policies and plans, both at the local, uh, regional and state level um, to, to um, see if there's anything we would like to recommend to um, change to make uh, active transportation uh, safer and more convenient. And um, the, the big outcome of this phase is a statement that will include a vision uh, for active transportation as well as goals, objectives, um, and uh, benefits of active transportation, and as well as a strategic safety program plan that specifically focuses on the safety of our road system. Um, and that's that's uh, more for an internal work plan for the county um, and VEDA to work towards um, and is not uh, a funded implementation plan. I'm sorry. So um, phase two, I should um, mention that this is where we really start to dive into the recommendations and network recommendations that were mentioned earlier. Um, so that's really when it becomes uh, interesting for property owners to, to get involved, to see uh, how the network is developing. Um, we already have a pretty extensive network. If you have looked at the map, of what's already in the comprehensive plan, but there are definitely some gaps in the network um, that make sense um, closing, for example, to connect to, to parks and schools and activity centers um, that may be new or newer and, and weren't uh, uh, there when, when the plan was last or the network was last updated um, or wasn't considered at that point. We also look at uh, funding prioritization methodologies um, and implementation guidance and also programmatic recommendations for the active transportation efforts that the county does outside of comprehensive planning efforts. And we started all of this last July, so we've been busy uh, on um, uh, doing a lot of this background work before we launched the public engagement, um, and we are going to finish phase one uh, this July, um, and then phase two uh, depends on when funding becomes available, what the timeline will be for that part. So now we would like to open it up again for discussion um, uh, specific, specifically about what your vision is for active transportation in Fairfax County. So please raise your hand if you would like to share um, or you can use the chat. So we'll start off. We have a, a question in the Q&A from Chris. Has phase two been funded and what is the timeline for phase two? So phase two has not been funded yet. Uh, we are currently uh, working on identifying funding. So once we have identified funding um, and it's possible that we have to break it into phase two and three um, uh, for, for funding reasons, um, and that will determine the timeline. So unfortunately at this time, we don't have a timeline yet. Do we have any other questions on or yes? Okay. Yes, we have uh, uh, from Devin. What kind of discussions have we had with Maryland and DC regarding integrating our trail network? 
uh, and Virginia's trail network over the Potomac? Oh, that's a good question. So, um, as part of this project, particularly phase 2, we will work closely with all our neighboring jurisdictions, um, or, and, and the jurisdictions that are within Fairfax County, like the, the uh, city of Fairfax, for example, or the town of Hearn, and that are surrounded by the county. We need to ensure um, that we, that we uh, work on, on the connectivity between um, the 2 jurisdictions and Maryland, of course, a bit more tricky with the river in between, but, um. Uh, currently, there is the potential opportunity if I'm not sure what the status is on the American Legion bridge and the hot lanes that are proposed, uh, both on the Virginia side and potentially the Maryland side that could lead. Fingers crossed to a trail if, if that all goes, um, um, goes to implementation. Um, but so there's coordination on which side of the, the bridge, the trail should be on. Um, uh, I think we took the safe route to. Prepare the the both sides uh, for potential trail connection, um, but yeah, there, it's 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 definitely something we're working towards. Nicole, maybe I can jump in a little bit more sure. detail on that. So the um, the project that VDOT is working on right now, the I four ninety five next project, which will extend express lanes in the uh, on the, along the beltway from just north of Tyson's to the American Legion Bridge does include a regional trail um, paralleling that and it is designed to uh, connect with a trail across the bridge uh, to allow um, bike and pedestrian access in the future um, between Maryland and, and uh, Virginia um, on the American Legion or the improved American Legion Bridge. So there is a significant amount of coordination that's going on there. Thank you, Tom. Do you have any other comments or questions on this section? All right, let's move on um, with an overview of the tools of engagement that we're currently using, and some of them have already been mentioned. Uh, the, the primary tool that I would like everyone that is attending today, as well as your friends and family, to um, participate in is a community survey which will be open until May 15th, and it's available on the um, county project website. Again, that's fairfaxcounty.gov slash transportation slash bike dash walk slash active Fairfax, or you can just uh, search for active Fairfax one word on the county website or on Google and would get you to this page. And the survey is available in eight different languages. Um, it takes about 14 minutes on average to complete. Uh, there are a lot of uh, good questions about uh, your your preferences uh, when it comes to active transportation, as well as uh, the design of those facilities. There are also questions on how would you prioritize uh, funding um, uh, for the different type of uh, facilities that are available in the transportation world um, and that we can um, or, or would like to improve. And if there's never enough funding to do it all. So um, we would love to hear from the community uh, what their preferences are. Um, so that's a, it would be really helpful to have those uh, um, uh, surveys filled out by as many people as possible. So thank you for, for taking a look at that. And then we had um, already uh, briefly um, talked about the interactive maps that are available on the website uh, for your use. So the first map here is um, um, intended to help the community identify uh, destinations for walking and biking, um, uh, but also barriers. So it's it's a point map. So you can zoom into the map and place a point um, in the location you would like uh, us to know about. And uh, you can leave a comment with that point. A box will, a, a box will pop up, and you can add a little description of what the issue is. And you can upload pictures um, if if you would like to. And that could be. You know, uh, a missing curb ramp or missing trail or uh, issues with accessing a bus stop. So anything like that is really helpful information for the county to have, not only for this process, but also for uh, future uh, funding cycles and, and um, um, safety issues that need to be addressed and such. So uh, 
that that's a great map for you to use if there's uh, already somebody has discovered something that you would like to mention and that comment is already there you can actually click on that comment and like it like you could like a, a post on facebook uh, with a little heart symbol you can click on that and the system will count how many people agree with that and it's just interesting for us to know what, what are the most glaring um, um, things that that the community would, would like to communicate and then there's the second map um, that we talked about in relation to the uh, Shreve Road uh, corridor. Uh, so that map actually shows the current land uh, network. So that is not that's pre this effort. So this is the, what was um, adopted in 2014 uh, on the bike um, master plan um, and um, and the current countywide trails plan, which has been frequently updated since the 1970s. Last updated in 2018, uh, I believe. Um, so those two two networks are available to view on the map, and those uh, current planned uh, routes and facilities are in solid lines. And any um, lines that were added by the community as a suggestion is a dashed line uh, in the same color, depending on if it's a trail or a bike a bike lane. Um, so you can see where uh, how the network um, uh, could potentially be developed in the future. And again, you can you can add any links that you would like um, and leave a, a comment describing the need or the thought behind this link. Um, as well as you can choose, you know, if it's a if it, if you would prefer a hard surface or a soft surface. Um, or uh, a complete streets enhancement as well. So if there's a corridor that uh, you think would benefit from light, more lighting or street trees or benches, uh, those can be highlighted on the map as well. So the next steps for this project is um, to continue public engagement until May 15th when we will close the survey and the maps for public comment and take, take them back to analyze what we have heard from the community, um, which will um, then uh, inform the, the development of the vision and goals reflecting key outcomes for active transportation in Fairfax County, uh, which will um, be available as a draft for public review, most likely early June um, at this point, um, before we take uh, the final draft to the Board of Supervisors for approval, and that will basically um, uh, complete phase one um, at some point this summer. So this completes the uh, uh, formal presentation uh, for tonight. Um, again, you can uh, contact us um, and learn more about the project on the project website. The link is, is placed on, on, um, on the top here. You can also reach us via email, um, activefairfax at fairfaxcounty.gov if you would like to share any, any um, information in addition to what you already shared tonight, um, or if you have a written statement like the gentleman from the beginning, that would be helpful for us to have in written form, um, or you can mail it to us um, at Fairfax County Department of Transportation, Attention Active Transportation Program, 4050 Legado Road in Fairfax. So now we open it up um, uh, one last time for an open discussion. Any questions, any comments are welcome um, before we conclude the meeting for tonight. Uh, I, don't, I don't see any hands or comments. Um, anybody want to take one last chance? Oh, here we go. Uh, Fran has raised her hand. I just want to remind everybody to not forget about the small projects in the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frank, for bringing that up again. And uh, we definitely take that comment uh, back to the consultants for consideration. And that's something we hear uh, frequently from the community um, that the need is it's really everywhere. Um, and, I um, understand that. And in yeah. some cases, they've been on the books for 50 years. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so our. Yeah, we, we, we're missing thousands of miles of sidewalks and neighborhoods, so it's it's definitely understandable that, that um, it's frustrating how long it takes to, to get those implemented. Um, 
but at the current funding level and the current cost of infrastructure, unfortunately, we are we are limited to. Um, it's actually a good amount of projects, but it's a big county for sure. But thank you again for the reminder. I understand that, and you know, it's safety is a big issue, and it's safety for everybody, not just somebody on one particular road. So hopefully, uh, there'll be a way to evaluate all of that, and I'm sure you will. So again, thank you all for this evening. Yeah, and and friend, uh, this is Chris Wells. Let me uh, just add Hi, to that. Hi, Chris. When the uh, when the board established a pedestrian program in 2002, we set up a pedestrian task force uh, to guide us in, in how we uh, approach issues such as, as funding. And that message was loud and clear that we we, we uh, were doing a good job or trying to do a good job on, on the route ones of the world and the route sevens of the world, which also had missing sidewalks, Sure, uh, but that we never got into the neighborhoods. And so we we actually made it a prior the board made it a priority to uh, not forget this neighborhood missing link, so to speak. And so in each of our uh, subsequent funding efforts, we've always included uh, neighborhood missing links. Uh, so the, the gentleman who spoke about Allen Avenue earlier is a perfect example of an excellent neighborhood missing link. So th thank you again for that feedback. We, we know that uh, we, we build big roads. And those roads have, you know, bike facilities and, and sidewalk facilities, but we have a lot of important missing needs um, in in neighborhoods that serve the communities to get to those. Yeah. So again, thank you so much. Thank you. I see, there's a comment in the chat uh, that asks if either I or Tom have ever walked the WD trail. I actually live very close to it and I do use it frequently. Um, and I'm um, aware of a lot of the issues with the trail. And that's definitely something we will work with uh, Nova Parks on um, uh, trying to, to find solutions uh, to some of the issues, particularly the big speak speed differential between some of the users, the faster cyclists and the slow pedestrians. Uh, some of the sections are overcrowded. Some of the crossings uh, 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 definitely are in need of enhancement um, and safety improvements. And uh, that will definitely be a focus point is that's the, the number one bike facility um, and pedestrian facility in Fairfax County that sees the highest use. And there's a, a pilot um, uh, in a different jurisdiction where they have a dual trail um, two trails next to each other, one for slower users and one for faster users, which would be potentially a solution to some of the issues. So, Nicole, just uh, just to answer the question, uh, I happen to be a resident of the Providence District, and I use the WNOD regularly. So, yes, I have have been on it uh, regularly as both a uh, pedestrian and as a bicyclist. Thank you. We have any. Any other questions or uh, another we raised other, hand? We do, uh, Jeremy. Uh, you're now unmuted. Um, Jeremy, are you there? Um, got your hand up. Unfortunately, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> we'll get it. We'll get it worked out. Um, thanks. I appreciate uh, the presentation opportunity to ask questions. I was also going to raise, I'm most familiar with the Shreve Road um, study. I don't know. There may be others in Fairfax County, but there's certainly recommendations within that study that VDOT did and um, to the extent that you're considering those type of studies, I think would be helpful in incorporating um, as the act of Fairfax moves forward. Sure, thank you for, for raising that. Um, yes, there, there are studies uh, similar um, that are more recent um, in different parts of the county. VDOT is doing the STARS study uh, recently on Route 50. They're currently looking at Little River, Little River Turnpike. Um, so those type of studies, um, that are still current uh, are definitely going to inform the plan um, moving forward. Thank you for mentioning that.
So it looks and, um, like this. Nicole, if I can add to that. No, I just want to thank you, Jeremy, and the community for working on that and advocating. I know we did a similar with um, kind of study, and that was VDOT uh, leading it this time over in Blake Lane Quarter. I know we have many. I grew up here and I use both trails quite often. Um, so I know the good thing about the engagement and the work, and, and Nicole and Chris and Tom have helped us put that together. Um, we are now, you know, and hopefully more looking forward with our new Secretary of Transportation able to apply for um, additional funding uh, at the federal level. And I know the work that's been done um, collaboratively in both of those quarters is being considered um, for funding. So, Chris, I don't know if you were going to add to that. Uh, sure, real quick, uh, we do. Uh, there's a lot of excitement in the. Uh, in the federal uh, transportation funding world uh, now. And so there are um, some opportunities that the county may have uh, to apply for uh, or to uh, make suggestions for federal funding. So uh, we uh, have have uh, looked at both the Shreve Road corridor and the Blake Lane corridor as a potential recipients of uh, some of this federal funding. So. Um, you know, tonight we're talking about the comprehensive plan level of, of um, the county and the, and the trails networks, but we also, a part of this uh, um, active Fairfax transportation plan effort is uh, how does the county prioritize funding? What uh, what metrics do we use to prioritize funding, such as uh, equity needs, safety needs, uh, filling in network gaps, uh, those type of things. And uh, so we're always actively um, and aggressively uh, trying to find uh, opportunities to fund, uh, as, as we've all acknowledged tonight, the, the, the great needs that there still are in our county. Thank you both. Right, someone just posted something in the chat. Let me just see. Mayor Pete would have would love. You are doing here. Don't forget about LNF and the safety needs that connect us. Thank you, David, for for reminding us. Um, we definitely take take a look at LNF, and uh, now I'm sure it's on the supervisor's radar as well. <laughs> so thanks again for joining us tonight. Uh, this concludes our meeting. Um, thanks for sharing all this uh, very detailed local feedback from the Providence District. Uh, so we have had uh, these meetings with all districts. This was the last one. Um, and we have great received great information. Um, so thanks again for participating. Um, and uh, um, just a, as a final reminder, please do take the survey and, and look at the maps if you get a chance um, and spread the word. Uh, that would be very much appreciated. Thank you so much. Nicole, and if I can add quickly to that, the sure. map, please, the survey I've been going through, the maps are very interactive. You can write comments, you can like the comments. And while this is, you know, countywide plan, I, I appreciate that it gives everyone the opportunity to go to their street level, to their uh, uh, trail level, and really show um, for us to be able to look at in the future where there's the most um, desire and need and, and be able to solve the micro level as well as the, the macro level for the county. So thank you. Um, and please share it out with your community. The more voices we get, the better the plan is going to be. Thank you, Supervisor. All right. Uh, well, um, thanks again for joining and have a good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you all.